You're listening to Scaling Up Services, where we speak with entrepreneurs, authors, business experts, and thought leaders to give you the knowledge and insights you need to scale your service-based business faster and easier. And now, here is your host, business coach, Bruce Eckfeld. Are you a CEO looking to scale your company faster and easier? Check out Thrive Roundtable. Thrive combines a moderated peer group mastermind, expert one-on-one coaching, access to proven growth tools, and a 24-7 support community. Created by Inc. award-winning CEO and certified scaling up business coach, Bruce Eckfeldt, Thrive will help you grow your business more quickly and with less drama. For details on the program, visit Eckfeldt.com slash thrive. That's E-C-K-F-E-L-D-T dot com slash thrive. Hello, everyone. This is Bruce. I'm doing a special intro to this episode. Unfortunately, my interview on this show is with Bradley Callow uh, when we recorded this a few months ago. And between then and now, uh, he was tragically killed. And I debated on whether or not to air this. I went back and listened to the episode a few times and decided that our conversation, his message, the work that he was engaged in was important enough that I wanted to, I wanted to get this out there. I wanted people to hear this. Really a uh, special conversation around how leaders can you know, connect with their families, with their children, uh, create uh, a legacy uh, above and beyond themselves uh, and their success, their personal success. Uh, I think it's a really important message for everyone, particularly for people who are uh, in leadership position. So I encourage you to listen to it. Um, like I said, it, it's a tragic, tragic event. I'm, my heart goes out to his family, uh, his wife, his daughter, and uh, you know I can't imagine what, what they have gone through uh, in this accident. So listen to the episode. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me at bruce at eckfeldt.com. But uh, I do think uh, it's important to get this out. I hope that this honors Bradley and his work and his purpose in life, which is sorely needed in our community. So with that, let's listen to the program. Welcome, everyone. This is Scaling Up Services. I'm Bruce Eckfeld. I'm your host. Our guest today is Bradley Callow. And Bradley is conscious entrepreneur and international speaker. He is also founder of Rich Legacy. And I met Bradley a few years ago at an EO event uh, in Thailand and Bangkok. And I'm excited to have him on the program. And we're going to talk a little bit about being a high performance person and what that means on the personal side, and particularly around parenting. So with that, Bradley, welcome to the program. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I'm excited given your insights into coaching coaching and what that looks like in the corporate world and a lot of the parallels I see that exist in the family side. It's just incredible how well they blend together and yeah. the benefits of applying things you learn in one and the other. So I'm excited to be here. Yeah. And I'm excited to have you. And I think, I guess for folks that uh, are listening to the program that have kids that are our parents, they will be, you know, really direct kind of takeaways. But I think even for folks who don't have parents or sorry, who don't have, hopefully everyone has parents that don't have children who aren't parents <laughs> and don't have children, you know, there's some really some, some good takeaways for those folks as well. So, uh, you know, I'd encourage you to continue listening, even if, if this is uh, doesn't seem immediately applicable, because, um, yeah, there are. There are a lot of connections, and there's a lot of connections that uh, anyone can learn from. So when I saw you speak at uh, at the EO event at GLC in Bangkok, you uh, had a really interesting and quite powerful story of, of kind of why you got into this space. Uh, and I'd love to, you know, have you just talk a little bit about that so you can kind of help people explain why this focus and, and why you're passionate about it and, and the difference and impact you want to have. Sure. So for, for me, I grew up in, in one of the wealthiest counties in the United States. And despite coming from you know what would be on the books, really good parents, right? I had a, a stay-at-home mom that used to be a special ed teacher who was very dedicated and involved in my life and wanted nothing but the best for me, loved me unconditionally. Uh, I had a, a father who was a, an avid entrepreneur with a, a growing and successful business at the time that still made every effort to be at my scouting events and sporting events and, you know, loved me with everything that he had. And and despite that, I started using drugs at 11 years old. And from there, it just only got got worse. And because I'm an entrepreneur with every fiber of my being, I started selling drugs shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. And despite all the things that were going on behind the scenes, I was able to keep up a pretty good front. And this is something consistent I see in the affluent families that I now work with all over the world is that you're keeping up appearances. And so I, you know, I, I squeaked by, I still got good grades, but I went off to college and then within a month was arrested for felony distribution and, you know, was able to recover from that. 
put on a good front. And next thing I know, I'm 24 years old. I'm on my knees in a Los Angeles apartment with a 1911 45 caliber handgun pressed to the side of my own temple. Yeah. And so these things, these happen quickly because my story is unfortunately is not, not uncommon. And in fact, you're one and a half to two and a half times more likely to have depression or anxiety if you come from an affluent family. Yeah. Now, certainly there's some overdiagnosis that might exist in that environment, and that's to be understood and appreciated. But the fact that it's that dramatic given that if you come from money you're supposed to that's supposed to solve all your, your problems in fact it's creating a lot of angst and stress and depression and and the suicide rate is quadrupled since 1950 for adolescents oh, yeah. and just on and on it goes i mean it's just this it's created this monster yeah. and so i you know was able to turn my own life around and decided to stop hurting myself and others and start helping and and that's how Rich Legacy was born. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, I think we do get caught into that trap of, you know, if if we have, uh, you know, a kind of a good background, a good upbringing, you know, money, you know, basic needs taken care of, then we shouldn't have any of these problems. And, and you know, it's just not the case. And I think that uh, we can get kind of lulled into a false sense of security, you know, if we if we think that. Well, I was, I was just going to elaborate on that because it's really important because it breeds shame. And there is this this overwhelming unconscious or conscious belief that nothing is ever good enough. Because if you come from money, the expectation is that you are excellent and amazing at everything because you don't have any excuses. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. You've, you've had every resource, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, you've got the resources to take care of all those things. So why should you have problems? Exactly. Yeah. So tell us about Rich Legacy. How has this manifested for you in terms of kind of your your purpose and the work that you're doing. So the the vision for Rich Legacy is is to become the Ivy League of family. And so what that means is, you know, 250 years from now, I actually just did an event uh, out on Yale's campus uh, in New Haven, Connecticut. And as I'm walking around and I'm seeing all these, you know, 100 year old buildings and this massive campus with all these students, you know, milling around. And and I just kept thinking to myself, it's like, this is what you can build. And, you know, they have a 300 year legacy at this point, but it's like, this is what you can build. And so the, the thing for me is, is that I want to build everything, whether it's education, uh, retreats for couples, for whole families, for young adults, for kids, I mean, you name it, and just attract the best and the brightest when it comes to the relationships that exist within family, because it is the foundation of everything. And I'm sure we'll get into this, but ultimately, every family that we have worked with, the business performance goes up exponentially when you start really putting some focus on making sure the family is all rowing in the same direction. Yeah. And I it's, you know, I, I mean, coming from the other side, <laughs> coming from, uh, you know, kind of focusing on the business side, you know, one of my phrases is that, you know, if you've got problems at home, you've got problems in your business. I mean, there, there, are, there is no, at least no long-term separation of those things. You might be able to get away with it for a while. You know, you could cope. But, you know, sustained performance uh, in business requires, you know, a good, well-balanced, you know, whole person. And if the entrepreneur, founder, CEO is, you know, has an unstable, unhealthy, unsupportive uh, family situation that's not gonna it's not gonna help them in the business side. It's it's gonna it's gonna tear them down at one point or another. Yeah, and that's great in- insight, and it extends to the employees. Yeah. The example I use very often is think about the last time one of your employees was going through a divorce or had a, a, a sick child or or parent. I mean, they might as well not be at the office. Yeah. And that's happening every day on a smaller scale as well. You know, if there's just stress and friction and and angst at home, well, that's impacting performance in a very meaningful way. Yeah. So why don't we start with just some discussion around what is family, I guess? How do you define it? What is the kind of scope and nature of what you refer to when we talk about family? So the primary focus for us is is the nuclear family. We are moving more and more in the direction of family businesses. Mm -hmm. So then we start looking more at the whole family system and how those all work together as well as individuals. So that's been a a really something that I've enjoyed and, and become fascinated with. We're actually working on a documentary around the whole concept that only about 10% of family businesses make it from the second to third generation and only 3% from the third to the fourth generation and really unpacking what it is those families do differently uh, to allow them to become an outlier and and achieve those things. Yeah. So a family can be defined very differently. It, it just depends. I mean, the, I don't know that I have a hard and fast definition to, to family of, of what that would or wouldn't be. Well, and I think that's probably good in the sense that, you know, there are there are so many different kind of versions and situations and, um, you know, kind of uh, contextual uh, differences that, you know, trying to coach 
or you know, trying to work on one particular formula or, or one particular construct of family versus kind of a general approach of kind of family dynamics and, and family success is probably serves you better or probably serves the people that you're working with better. And what are the dynamics? So, I mean, you, you're kind of applying it to these family businesses, but, you know, essentially, what are you trying to get at when you're helping people live a kind of a rich family life? What does that mean? What does that look like for you? At its core, it's family alignment. All right. If everyone begins to operate on the same page, if everyone truly has a, a deeper connection and a trust and a rapport that exists within the family, how that starts to change things. Once you have that trust and that connection, you're able to truly start understanding each other because you stop lying to each other. You stop being so passive aggressive. And once you have a deeper understanding of each other, well, then you're in a place where you can start having compromise and meaningful dialogue and create some movement forward together instead of working against each other each other. And then from there, you're in a position equipped with understanding and compromise. You can start to influence each other in a positive way and influence your environment or your goals or whatever those might look like. And all these things start to work together in this beautiful way. And it just allows people, for lack of a better term, I don't know if I've ever put it this way, but to, to blossom, to use family as a source of, source of strength and power versus a source of distraction and distress. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you know, because we talk, uh, you know, I, I do all this work with leadership teams and, and I say my, my core job is help the leader team thrive, you know, level up, become a, a higher performing team. But, you know, you could say that about family. I mean, you could, you could apply kind of the same logic or the same kind of idea to the family as team, you know, different type of team, different kind of relationship, potentially different kind of outcomes. But, you know, you're talking about a group of people working together against a common set of objectives and core values and, you know, measurement of success. It is. And and the beauty of, of family and why I like it and it's so challenging and why so much of this stuff applies to business is if you can if you can create this kind of change within a family, you can most certainly create that kind of change in a business yeah. because a family is an unwilling participant, right? <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, depending yeah. on the, yeah, yeah. You know, depending on the age of the kids, you run into some, and, and that's, I, I will throw that out there for the listeners is I've never had somebody come to me and be like, wow, I wish I would have started this stuff later. But I very often have people like, oh, my kids are too young for some of this stuff. I'm like, start now, like just yeah. build it to the culture and the very fiber uh, that your family is, is made of and you, you won't regret it. It's funny. I'll tell you a funny uh, uh, little story. I, you know, as a coach, you know, one of my things, I'm a kind of voracious learner. I'm always listening to things and, and reading things and listening to things. And I was, I had a book on tape. I think it was Crucial Conversations, right? I, I know it was Crucial Conversations on the on a trip we were taking, uh, I think, from New York up to Boston or something. And and, uh, and my, I think it was five years old at the time, my, uh, my second son, like three days later, uh, we're kind of having this discussion about something. And he looks at me and he says, Dad, we need to have a crucial conversation. First, we need to establish safety. <laughs> just, yes. I, just left. I was just like, but you yes. know what? I was like, good. You know what? You know, we should have more safety in our conversation <laughs> as a family. You know? Yes. It's, it's just spot on because my kids are such sponges and kids are smarter than ever. And while the Internet has its downsides and in many ways is working 24 seven to undermine every life skill, value and character trait you want to teach your kids <laughs> when they use it correctly. I mean, they the kids today are wicked smart. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, one of the funniest things to me is, uh, you know, a. Uh, uh, a kid will come to their parent, you know, a teenager and be like, well, you know, you're telling me not to do drugs, mom and dad. But, you know, everything I'm hearing about marijuana is it's really not bad for me. If anything, it's a medicine. And the parents are like, no, no, no. Like drugs are bad. You know, end of discussion. Well, you know, the kid goes, OK, fine. And walks away and comes back three hours or three days later and slams down the 750 <laughs> printed pages with highlighters and tabs and everything else. And it's like. Oh, this is not what parenting used to be. Yeah, right. The Thirty-two, <laughs> how the 32 reports on cannabis use. Yes, yeah, funny. So I, I run a, another podcast called uh, Thinking Outside the Bud, which is all about the cannabis space. And I've, I've personally had to have that, you know, that kind of discussion or that kind of, you know, conversation with with my kids of, of explaining it is a drug. You know, it has uh, some benefits and in, in various medical applications. And you know, there's various changes in the laws going on. It doesn't mean I want you to run around and smoke pot, but you know, but having kind of having the conversation and meeting them where they are in the in the kind of understanding of it is part of the process. It is. And and, and uh, as soon as you start lying to kids, they don't believe anything else. Yeah, right. So, so, you know, even, even saying it like, like to me, that whole,
whole thing is kind of confusing. I haven't completely unpacked that in my whole brain, but like, why, why, why we start this whole relationship off with, hey, I've just been lying to you your whole life. Yeah. No big deal. You know, it's an interesting cultural phenomenon that that we embrace. But uh, but yeah, it's it's having those uh, <laughs> authentic, meaningful conversations. And and one of the things that I'm a, a firm believer in is there is so many things to be afraid of as a parent these days. Yeah. I mean, you basically see kids going to the bus stop and they got on shin guards and knee pads and elbow pads and wrist guards and a helmet and they're walking 10 feet to the bus stop right so like it's the fear is everywhere and and so my thing is i'm i'm here to work on your kids core right like their mm-hmm. self esteem their ability to make adult decisions right their yeah. ability to think with empathy and and to be a, a grounded human being because i could spend all day and all year trying to to protect them from well, bullying and drugs and alcohol and, mm-hmm. you know, sex and, you know, you name it. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you and I both know people that have done drugs and they aren't dead. They're not in prison. They're not in jail. Yep. We know people that have, you know, gotten to darker parts of their life and been able to turn those things around yeah. because at their core, they were healthy and able to deal with those things. Yeah. So talk to me about, about the core. So self-esteem. What else? What else did you mention there? Self-esteem, emotional intelligence. It looks a little different for every every kid that we work with, right? Okay. Because, you know, if, if we can tap in and, and find a kid's passion, that's that's where the fire is. Yeah. I mean, you know, for anybody listening, if your kids are young, take notes. Like the little things that light your kid up. I don't care if it's being nice to others, if it's writing, if it's dancing, if it's singing, if it's painting. Like what are those things that they naturally are drawn to? Yeah. And make notes of those things because because society and life will kind of pull them out of you. But then to revisit those things over time is really important because if you can use passion as a vehicle for learning, your relationship with your child will change dramatically. Their relationship with themselves will change dramatically and their relationship with the world will change dramatically. Yeah. So like uh, one of my favorite favorite stories working with a client. Uh, his son was nine years old at the time. EO member, actually, since I know we connected through EO and, and, uh, he was struggling with math homework. It was like World War Three every day. The dad came home and was like, ah, like I can't handle this anymore. Like it, <laughs> it, it literally feels like a bomb is going on. So he starts staying at the office later and later and yep. mom starts getting angrier and angrier and you know, it just got worse and worse. And, and so we helped dad reestablish a, a better relationship with his son that connection piece so he could get to a place where he could find out what is his son's passion because he wasn't able to at the beginning. And then once he was able to figure out what his passion was, which was entrepreneurship, just like dad, well, we had a great conversation, Bruce. Math equals money and money equals math. (laughs) If you don't have a basic understanding of math, it's going to be hard to make any real money and be a successful entrepreneur. Well, guess what happened? Most improved pupil of the quarter. No more arguments about math homework. No more World War Three. And but think about in contrast to how that would normally look. It would be like you live under my roof, you play by my rules, and your yeah. job is school and school includes math. Like get it together. Yeah. Doesn't work. Yeah. Well how do so how do we balance the kind of need to fuel passion with the need to kind of create a reasonable kind of uh, boundaries and kind of safety around certain things. I mean, is there is there a strategy or, or how do you how do you deal with that? Oh, uh, could you give me a more specific example well, where, so where you're seeing that? There may be a passion that is not, you know, that involves some kind of risk or potential for physical harm. You know, <laughs> like how do you help sort of fuel that and channel that in a way that's going to be in fact, I mean, I guess, do you see there's a need to provide some kind of boundaries or structure to, to you know, kind of the child relationship in that sense? I mean, it, it's so individual. Yeah. You know, every human being is so unique in, in what that might look like. I'll give you a fun example that I run into a lot and I'm sure a lot of the listeners can relate to is virtually every kid I meet these days wants to be a YouTube star. Like, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's like without fail. OK. Yeah. And the normal response is that's a horrible idea. Don't waste your time. Well, <laughs> logically, logically. I, yes. <laughs> I, well, uh, I, uh, I've got I've got some counter arguments. Sure, right? Number one, you can make millions of dollars crocheting sweaters for cats these days. Yeah. So I just want to point that out. <laughs> and your margins are like 80 or 90 percent. You work from home or anywhere in the world that you want to. Who's really got the bad idea here? Yeah. But that's a different conversation. Yeah. But but if you just think about it from a passion as a vehicle for yeah. learning perspective, yeah. YouTube being a YouTube star, what can you teach a kid through that? Get them all excited about it. They're going to learn marketing, like yeah. SEO and 
you know, advertising, yeah. they're going to write video production. They're going to learn confidence with public speaking and communication and like on and on it goes. They can turn, learn about licensing and you can take it as far as you want to. Or you can say that that's a horrible idea. Don't waste your time. Let's dig into that a little bit, because I think I think there is my, my kind of thesis on that is there's there's another thing underpinning that. I think I, I certainly I think I, I tend to be the you know, let's try anything kind of approach. Uh, and I've, I, we've done YouTube channels. We've done, uh, we've started little businesses. You know, I, nice. I tend to be uh, probably on the very willing to, to try just about anything. But I think what happens for a lot of folks, it, particularly as a parent, I think the challenges or the, the gut reaction is, well, if you do that and it doesn't work out, you're going to feel failure. You're going to feel some kind of disappointment. And I don't, I want to protect you from that disappointment by preventing you from going into the first place. I think that is what is under underlying some of those things. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. It is. And that is that's the equivalent of poisoning the well. Yeah. Right. Well, you're, you're, because, you're projecting uh, your uh, fear onto them. Well, and, and you're denying them the grit and resilience while they're under your wing and they can learn and have you there to support them when they, uh, you know, they will fail. They will be hurt. Yeah. The, they will have these letdowns or you can wait till they go to college and they're out on their own and have access to anything and everything. Yeah. And then they go and implode because they can't handle any sort of stress because they've been shielded from it. You know, yeah. it's like riding a bicycle. If if you never let a kid learn to ride the bicycle, if you never let go of the back of that bike seat, if you never take off those training wheels, what does that kid never learn? They never learn how to ride a bike in the first place. Number two, they don't learn boundaries because if they go too fast and they fall down, it hurts. So they learn not to do that, that again. Mm -hmm. Or they don't learn that if they fall and it hurts, they can still get back up again and try. Yeah. But if you deny them of all those things by constantly trying to protect them, it's like the helicopter yeah. uh, mom kind of approach. And I even call it bubble parenting at this point where it's like, <laughs> let's just throw a bubble suit on this. Bubble kid. wrap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, like yeah, I'm not even playing around anymore. Like let's uh, just get on a bubble. Yeah. Like I've a turbo that. wheel. Right. Like, well, it's like I, I've seen the, uh, you know, kids skiing and stuff like that. And they come down the mountain and they're just like they're just a big, a big ball of protection. <laughs> they have no control, yeah. but they're fully protected. Well, and I, you know, I've I've worked with royal families. I've worked with, you know, 50 founders. Uh, yeah. Gosh, I mean, it, Fortune 10 executives. Right. I've worked with some really bright people. And the recurring thing, and this was actually what happened with my dad, is that as intelligent and driven people, their superpower, your superpower, my superpower is I'm an inherently good problem solver. Yeah. Like that's that's what I do. That's how I make a living, right? Like that's how I see the world. And so I take that into an environment with kids. And the problem is, is that I'm still got some ego left and I want to show how awesome I am. Here's my superpower. Look at how I solve problems. And so instead of letting the kid learn my superpower, which is my greatest gift and asset, I deny them of that by solving the problem for them. And then they're not learning in the same way. They feel shame. So I'm going to make a I'm going to make a jump. I'm going to do it and we'll see how it works, <laughs> which is, you know, one of one of the things I find with founders um, as they move, as they start to build out their leadership team and the company starts to grow, one of the things that we have to kind of untrain them on is solving all the problems. Uh, because if, if they continue to be the chief problem solving officer, that they will never develop a team that can solve their own problems and, and ideally can actually solve bigger and harder problems than they can alone, you know, using the capabilities of the team. But it is really hard. And it's a, and it's a mm. jump that not all founders can make, quite honestly. And, mm -hmm. and I, so I, I think mm -hmm. there's a similarity there and not not to say that, you know, managing people is like having children necessarily. But I think that that mindset of what is my job here is my job to solve the problems or is my job to create you know a person to help a person learn, get experience, uh, build confidence so that they can be more capable, more self-sufficient over time? I think that's the key. Mm, yeah. And, I, and again, there's another parallel. Yeah. I mean, the parallels are endless. I mean, think about uh, within a family. Uh, so often the rules are inconsistent. You know, the parents forget <laughs> the, what the rules are all the time. I'm like, I don't remember what the rule is. The rule today is no, you know, no shoes in the car. Well, sorry, dad, I didn't know that was the rule or it wasn't the rule last week. And, you know, think about if you ran a business that way, yeah. if you didn't have a clear job description, if you didn't have clear expectations of what was something that's a positive and rewarded behavior or one that's a negative and, and has a consequence, you, you'd lose your people all the time. But yet we expect the family to operate differently. It's it's fascinating. And what's interesting, and, and you'll appreciate this as a coach, yeah. in virtually any other environment other than family, 
having a coach is like kind of a badge of honor. Like, yeah, I've got, you know, I've got a personal trainer. I've got, yeah. I've got a, you know, a, a coach in my business. I've got yeah. a coach on my tennis or whatever it is. And as yeah. soon as it's like, Oh, I have a coach for my family. You're like, wait, what? <laughs> you're just wrong? supposed to, you're, <laughs> yeah, you're just supposed to that bad. <laughs> figure out family on your own. It is so mind blowing. It makes no sense. Yeah. And, and again, it's the foundation of everything. Yeah. If you get the family dialed in, if you get them happy and healthy and you're all working together, everything else in your life gets better. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. We were talking earlier about some of the techniques that, you know, personally I've, I've, you know, applied and I, I sometimes I don't even think about it. It's just cause I'm a coach, you know, it just comes out, but, um, you know, just the idea of, you know, th- thinking about the family as a, as a type of team and what makes a good team and, and its ability to kind of set goals and get clear around priorities, figure out those priorities. The one thing I find is getting getting clear on what your kind of ground rules are and, and making them really yours. Um, you know, just because other families do things a certain way doesn't need to be the way you do it. As a divorced dad, I've, I've got uh, three children that don't live with me every day. And so, you know, I've had to kind of create different kind of patterns and structures and kind of ways in which we operate, which are maybe not like a lot of other families. And, mm-hmm. and but by cl- figuring out what our priorities are and what do we really care about and focusing on those and, and be willing to give up on a, a lot of other things that yeah, may be important to other people, but we're just, cho- we're going to choose not to focus on those for our situation has been really powerful. I think that's worked really mm-hmm. well for us. Yeah, It has. And I'm big on ownership and buy-in. So when it comes to family rules, we call them family agreements. Mm -hmm. The opportunity is to involve the kids as much as possible in this process. It goes back to that kind of you live under my roof concept Mm -hmm. versus a the same thing in a business, right? How do I get the group together to collectively come up with what we're all about, right? And Mm -hmm. and how we're going to rise to the challenge of supporting each other and achieving that. I mean, I've done this with kids as, as little as six years old. And, you know, we also work with a lot of young adults, but, you know, to have a six-year-old, when you ask them, like, what's important in your family? And they say love and safety and health. And we're like, okay, so like, what are the things you can do or as a family you can do to support those things? And then they'll start rattling off all these things and we fine tune those. And, you know, if the kids are older, it, it might be, you know, safety means what does our curfew look like? Mm-hmm. Okay, what are the consequences if you don't, you know, if you, you yeah. miss the curfew and the kid at first is going to be like, absolutely nothing. Or, you know, <laughs> I, I get I get a new iPad. And you've got to be like, well, I was thinking you should be deported. So <laughs> let's meet in the middle. Yeah, right? Exactly. Compromise. This is where you learn compromise. Yeah. Yes. Negotiation. Right. And and so like to, to create a set of family agreements and consequences and have everybody write this out and then sign it is so incredibly powerful versus being like, here's the rule today. Yeah. Here's the rule tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, well, it's funny. We talk about this a lot in, uh, in, in management on the business side of, of the difference between compliance and commitment, you know, and, and, compliance is when you you issue an edict you you put out a rule and you know with power you can get people to follow the rule through compliance they will comply to that rule but the moment that power structure mm-hmm. situation is not there, there there is nothing enforcing that compliance whereas if you get commitment meaning that they they have participated in the process they have personal stake in the, the reason for that commitment they see how that is going to benefit them ultimately that that com- that true commitment will be something that holds true even when you're not there. And I think the same thing is true with parenting. Mm, yeah, well said. Well said. Yeah. Again, I mean, the parallels are, are just yeah. incredible. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's that's why we, we've done so well is because, you know, we, we go, we speak to EO and YPO and some of these kind of organizations and and the entrepreneur or executive loves what we're talking about because they can connect to the material apply it to their business apply it to their family it yep. makes sense because so many of them feel, feel like i'm good in my business but i have no idea what i'm doing in my family i'm like well let's bridge that gap and then the spouse is sitting there and they're just thrilled because all of a sudden the entrepreneur and the executive is excited about this concept of family and yeah. so everybody wins it's awesome yeah no re- really powerful um and uh, you know i that see, seeing you in in Bangkok, you know, I know you've developed a lot of things since then. Uh, but I think that you know that early message that I saw was 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 really interesting, and I'm excited that you're really kind of growing this and and you know building um, 
building the organization to to help really put this out there and, and get more people involved. So tell us a little bit about what, that. what your next steps are. So I know you're doing a lot of speaking. What is what is your vision right now? Where where are you looking to kind of take this next few years? Great question. So this is documentary uh, I'm really excited about with family businesses uh, yeah. because it's it's such a, a great client for us because we create value and change within you know one nuclear family and then we go and work with the brother or the sister or multiple brothers and sisters in their family. And then we're able to do a collective because we do uh, family retreats is a huge part of what we do. We usually kick off our coaching by going and spending a weekend uh, with myself or, you know, two other facilitators. But there's always two facilitators, a male and a female uh, that go in as the coaches to facilitate Sorry. these for the families. And, and so over time. The ability to then do larger family retreats with multiple families or multiple generations and and to, you know, create this massive change, because once we change the hearts and minds of these executives and these entrepreneurs, they then take this into their business. And then the culture changes within the business about the relationship between family and work. And so our ability to create this massive impact and change is, you know, intoxicating for me. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm looking to change the world. I'm not looking to just, you know, make a few bucks. <laughs> I have I have no I have no exit strategy. Like yeah. I'm I'm in it for the long haul. This is, this is what I'm built for. So yeah, it's uh, I'm excited to see where the family business world takes us. But uh, but that's that's the main focus. I'm trying not to overcomplicate things because I'm a an innovator and a shiny <laughs> object guy, and I, I could probably talk for like 45 minutes about ideas. But yeah, I'm fun. sticking with that for right now. I love it. Good. Bradley, this has been a pleasure. Um, if people want to find out more information about you, about the work that you do, what's the best way to get that? Uh, richlegacy.com is the the easiest. And, and like any fast moving entrepreneur, it's probably a little bit out of date. I should probably look at it and see, <laughs> see what's on there versus what we're actually doing in true entrepreneur form. But uh, but yeah, I'm happy to help in any way I can. And that's why I got into this. So if people want to get in touch with me directly, it's just B as in Bradley, uh, Callow, C-A-L-L-O-W at richlegacy.com. Com. Again, that's B Callow at richlegacy.com. And, and we've got some great assessment tools and quizzes and, and things that can start giving you some insight into your family and start having some of these more meaningful conversations that maybe you thought about, maybe you haven't, but I guarantee you're not having them. And, and just having those conversations alone can start to open up some meaningful dialogue and change within your family. And you can also see the business benefits that go with that. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thank you so much for taking the time. I, I really appreciate it. It's been a great conversation. Likewise, I had fun anytime. You've been listening to Scaling Up Services with business coach Bruce Eckfeld. To find a full list of podcast episodes, download the tools and worksheets, and access other great content, visit the website at scalingupservices.com. And don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter at scalingupservices.com slash newsletter.